after a couple of technical issues, <laughs> I think we can start right now. So hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all for the year's last session of topics in early modern uh, studies. Unfortunately, Livia won't be joining us today, but I'm sure I can speak for both of us when I say that we are very glad for your participation. This has been a fantastic experience for the two of us, and I hope you have been joining that as well. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I would like uh, to give you the house rules. So please keep your microphones muted during the entire talk. After the presentation, we will have time for questions. Uh, I would ask you to use the raise hand function to let us know you want to speak. Or if you prefer to type, please use the chat uh, to comment or make questions. Feel free to type questions in Portuguese, Spanish, French or English, and um, I can read them or translate them if necessary. Finally, uh, I would also like to remind you that the session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, channel later. Uh, hopefully, by the end of the year, all the videos will be online. We'll let you know through our mailing list and our social media as well. Well, uh, having that said, um, I'm very honored to receive Dr. Luis Felipe Silveiro Lima today. Uh, he teaches early modern history as an associate professor in the history department of the, the Federal University of Sao Paulo. He received his BA, MA and PhD from the University of Sao Paulo and was a fellow at the John Carter Brown, uh, John Carter, uh, Brown Library in Brown University. His main research interests uh, refer to the production of circulation the production and circulation of prophecies and apocalyptic ideas in Portugal, England, and the Americas in the early modern period. Uh, Luis Felipe is the author of a series of articles and books. Among them, I would like to highlight visions, prophecies, and divinations, which he organized together with Ana Paula Torres Magiani. Uh, besides all of that, Luis Felipe is my PhD supervisor, and I'm particularly happy to have him as a, as a speaker today. He will present a paper entitled uh, Fake News about the False King Sebastian of Portugal in Eliz Elizabethan and Jacobean England, which I'm sure will be a fascinating closure for this year of discussions. Uh, so thank you, Luis Felipe, for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, Thank you, Veronica, for organizing everything. And so uh, this paper I, I will deliver is part of a broader research. It's a work in progress. Uh, and I hope to uh, not only talk, but also learn with you and with your questions after my talk. I hope that it, it's interesting for you as well as for me. Uh, so I'm going to present here let me okay <laughs> perfect so i guess now you are seeing i I'm, I'm going i'm going to read because it's i'm worried about the time and i have uh, several tiny details uh, to talk about so uh so i start i'm starting to to read here between 1605 and 1606 gervas smith a portland minister from Polstad in suffolk was denounced to and investigated by members of the privy council among them robert cecil secretary of state based on the interpretation of prophetic texts uh, from books smith had inherited he had uttered a prophetic interpretation by which the papist James I would be dethroned by the truly Protestant Edward VI, who would either resurrect from the dead or return from Africa, where he have, would have been read, hidden in self-exile since 1553. Uh, in October 8, 8, 16, 8, 1606, 1606, one of the witnesses summoned by the Privy Council, Council, yeah, yeah. Uh, Councillors, Minister, Minister John Hawking was inquire, inquired about his contact with Smith and his so-called prophecies. Hankin said that a couple, couple of years ago, Smith had defended his messianic vision interpretation of the prophecies by showing him a book which proved that Sebastian I, King of Portugal, was alive and should, should do great things. And this would equally happen to Edward VI. I'm, I'm going to read. 
uh, being asked whether uh, uh, he had any speeches with him about prophecies, he said that it is so ordinary with him, Smith, that every man takes knowledge of it, and that he, his examination, had forbidden many from his com company in respect of that. But for himself, he had had not, no speech with him of late concerning prophecies. Only two or three years ago, he showed him a book that Sebastian, the king of Portugal, reported to be dead, was alive as he thought and should do great things. The book most likely was one of the three pamphlets translated from French and published between 1601 and 1603, uh, narrating the adventures of the Sebastian of Venice, who claimed to be Sebastian I of Portugal, missed in action during the Battle of Xara Kilbir in Morocco in, in 1578. In this battle, no know also as the Battle of the Three Kings, the Portuguese army led by Sebastian IV, uh, by Sebastian the First joined forces, uh, uh, the Portuguese, ar sorry, the Portuguese army led by Sebastian the First joined forces with the ousted Sultan Abdallah Muhammad's small army against the current Moroccan Sultan Abdal al-Malik the First, Muhammad's uncle and a strong ally of Elizabethan England. Muhammad's and Sebastian forces were defeated by al-Malik's army but more tragically, tragically for the time sensibilities, the three princes involved in the battle in the battle were killed without leaving the direct heirs. Hence the name, uh, the name Battle of the Three Kings. The news about the triple tragedy circulated throughout Christendom and Islam by letters, chronicles, ballads, in pamphlets, engravings, gazettes. This outcome had several political impacts for North African kingdoms, but also for European monarchies. For Portugal, it eventually, uh, it eventually represented its incorporation to the Habsburg crown in a dual monarchy of Portugal and Spain that lasted until 1640. Through this Iberian, the Iberian Union, Philip II of Spain became ruler of all the Portuguese colonies in the Americas, Africa and Asia, and he could finally use his father, father's imperial motto with propriety, the empire on which the sun never sets. If on one hand, Xal Kibir outcome uh, was fav favorable for England since its Moroccan allies won, on the other, the Portuguese crown succession to Philip II represented bad news. And trying to gain some influence in the Iberian Peninsula, Elizabeth, Elizabeth I partially supported the claims of another pretender to the Portuguese throne, Antony, prior of Crato, and Sebastian I's cousin. Antony and his itinerant court eventually sought refuge in London after being defeated by Philip's II troops. But despite all the promises of protection and favor made by by Elizabeth, they were always marginalized in English court and put under constant surveillance, both from English and Spanish informants and spies. After an ill attempted invasion of Portugal due to the lack of support of Francis Drake's fleet in 1589, he and his supporters left England and Antony ended dying misery in Paris in 1595 and his former court of exiles was dispersed throughout Europe. Meanwhile, the news about Sebastian I's death was received with some disbelief in Portugal, and long, not long after the acclamation of Philip II of Spain as Philip I of Portugal in 1581, rumors of Sebastian's survival in North Africa became more and more frequent, frequent as well as the appearance of pretenders claiming to be the returned Sebastian, now impersonating the hidden king, Wincuberto. Uh, from late medieval and early modern Iberian prophecies, who, after a period hidden in Africa in penitence for his sins, would return to save the Portuguese kingdom from uh, and people from its oppressors. One of those pretenders was the Sebastian of Venice, probably the one depicted in the book showed by to Hankin by Gervais Smith. Around June 15, 1598, a mysterious man appeared in Venice claiming to be Portuguese even though he barely spoke the Portuguese language. Asked who he was and why his Portuguese was so poor, he said that he could not identify, identify himself because of an oath. 
the rumor got around, and by a series of coincidences, he was eventually identify, identified as being King Sebastian of Portugal, who many doubted had, doubted had in fact died in the Battle of Xara uh, exactly 20 years earlier. Many of the former members of the itinerant Anton Antonist court went to Venice to try to recognize their late king in that mysterious man. Convinced that he was the undercover, the, the hidden monarch, the hidden king, they wrote and divulged countless letters, treaties, pamphlets, and began a campaign for the Sebastian of Venice to be recognized by European crowns and to remove Philip of Spain from the Portuguese throne. That plan didn't work work out very well. And the Sebastian of Venice, now identified as Calab a, a Calabrian trickster, Marco Tullio Cacizoni, was eventually handed over to the Spanish authorities along with several of his companions. In San Luca de Bagameda, he was tried and, tried and convicted. Cacizoni had to abjure and publicly declared that he was not Sebastian of Portugal, had his right hand cut off and was hanged on September 1603. He was not the first false Sebastian to appear, but without doubt, the Sebastian of Venice was the most famous, famous Sebastian pretender at the time and about whom more news circulated. Reports about his case reached Spain, Portugal, Rome, France, the Dutch Republic, the whole empire and England. Text and news about his adventures were printed in French, Dutch and English. Sebastian of Venice uh, and Portuguese, uh, of course, a Sebastian of Venice history have been studied by its repercussion in early modern Portugal, Spain, Italy, and France. However, the reception of the news in Elizabeth and Jacobean England is perhaps worth looking at in a greater detail. For the sake of comparison, in a very thorough survey carried, carried out by Ana Maria Camalheira about the literary representation of Xara el Kibir and Sebastian I in the whole empire, uh, she only identified a brief mention about Sebastian of Venice in a manuscript collection of news. This is scarce reference contrasts with more than a dozen of German reports that circulated about Xala Kibir right after the battle, followed by the translation of several chronicles and pamphlets about the end of Sebastian I's reign, the Iberian Union, the claims of Antony, Prior, Prior of Crato, printed until the early 17th century. As I, int I intend to show, the reception in England surpassed by far a couple of mentions to Sebastian of Venice adventures. But why this English interest in the false Sebastian? Cases of false pretenders were not untimely. As we can learn by Yves Marie Berset and Eliève Feldon uh, studies, the Sebastian of Venice was one among several impostors that inhabited 16th and 17th cent century European imagination. Many of these impostors' stories were told and written either to report the news of some hidden king as another fabulous tale, or to denounce another case of imposture and give one more example of the common's credulity. There are plenty of examples if we look at, at the English sources of the period, as shown by Thomas Hugh, among others. In a very pre preliminary fashion, it is possible to list some reasons for the English interest in the development of Xala Kibir battle and its consequences. The anti-Hispanic and anti-Catholic feeling due to the memory of the reign of Mary Tudor and her husband, King Philip II, vigorously resumed during the Anglo-Hispanic War and after the defeat of the Invincible Armada in 1588. The support about Feeble given by Elizabeth I for the claims to the Portuguese crown by the pretender and Antony already during the Iberian Union. And perhaps no less important, the fascination that North Africa and the kingdoms of the Moors exerted, not only because of a proto-Orientalist attraction, but because of a concrete interest in the material possibilities that North Africa represented for the imperial plans of the late Tudors and the early Stuarts. Notwithstanding, the news that King Sebastian had returned and appeared in Venice in 1598 to overthrow Philip III of Spain could be read in different ways at the time of political turmoil and confessional impasses due to the succession of Elizabeth I. It was possible, for instance, to do parallels uh, with the Portuguese case since Elizabeth was hurlless as Sebastian uh, and one of the pretenders, James VI of Scotland, was already king of another realm. 
but maybe an overall because of the Anglo-Iberian relations on the one hand tense with Spain and on the other supposed supposedly close with Portugal. The death or disappearance of Sebastian I in Xari Kabir and, and its implications in terms of Anglo-Iberian relations were extensive material for the most varied productions from right, from right after the battle until at least the 1630s. And it, and it is in this bulge of production that the case of Sebastian of Venice must be understood. A good example of the presence of Xalal Kibir and Portugal's tragedy and the possible relations with the Sebastian of Venice can be measured on the Elizabethan Jacobean stages. At least three plays on this theme were written, staged and printed between the years 1588 and 1605. In 1588-1589, uh, the Battle of Alcácer was performed and printed in a pamphlet in 1594 and reenacted several times between 1598 and 1603, 1603. The famous history of Captain Thomas Stuckley, which dealt with the uh, events of Xalal Kibir, was possibly staged during the same period and, print, and was printed in 1605. And, and in 1601, uh, a play called Sebastian, King of Portugal, was staged, most likely based on the strangest adventure of Sebastian of Venice, the same book that probably belonged to Gervais Smith and which I will discuss below. If we look at the dates of, of staging and printing of the place, even, uh, even the Battle of Ocasio originally written in, in, in the 50, 1580s, we will see that they roughly coincide, coincide with the period of new circulation about the false Sebastian. Therefore, I intend to discuss how the news about the false, false Sebastian of Venice uh, uh, was received in England in a period of dynastic change. Here I intend to think about the statues of veracity and credulity about Sebastian's news coming from Venice. My question will be which notions of proof, belief, imposture and falsehood guided the perception of the authenticity of the authenticity, authenticity of the cause of Sebastian of Venice. At first, I will present some premises that are guiding these questions, giving some examples and delimiting some of my hypotheses. Afterwards, uh, these questions will be seen in three groups of sources, letters about the new circulation in Elizabeth London, the pamphlets translated from French and printed, printed between 1601 and 1603 on the adventures of Sebastian and the ones read by Smith, or so I suppose, and Finally, diplomatic sources in the calendars of state papers present on the calendars of state papers and Cecil papers. Just, okay, yeah. In general, uh, uh, no, so I, I, I go to the first part of, of my, my talk. In general, there are three ways in historiography of thinking about these falsifications and impostures in the early modern period. The first is to consider that, that people, especially from, pop, from popular strata, were more credulous because they lacked certain mental apparatuses pertaining to a supposedly more scientific rationality. Uh, it is the position of 19th century texts which told histories of tricksters and charlatans, for example. But this approach still appears indirectly in, a more, in more contemporary works, albeit with an inverted sign. In this more recent historiography, it is assumed that the tricksters were people who used these devices and the renational re and the, in the re re sorry, irrational credulity as a strategy of social ascension or even resistance in the absence of other more rational means to do so, as in the recent, recent book by Tobias Hugg, that I mentioned before. Another approach in, in contrast to this is to argue that the standards of proof and authority were more or less similar to ours, or that they arose in the early modern period. And so we should read this phenomena through lenses of truth, not very, very different from contemporary ones. Uh, this is paradoxically, if one considers the almost antiquarian preoccupation of his studies, Anthony Grafton's position in his Forger and Critics, while trying to reconstruct a history of the relationship between forgery, copying, and scholarship. Or even Darton's when, uh, 
Darton's position when comparing in magazine or articles or interviews the fake news of the 17th and 18th century with those of today or before. In opposition to interpretations such as Grafton's, authors such as uh, Mead and Eliab Feldon have affirmed uh, the need to think about uh, how the lines of demarcation between what was considered false and true, or false or true, varied uh, uh, along, uh, along times. These demarcations would be much more diffused in the 15th and 16th centuries, according to Eliab Feldon, uh, which would make our classification of imposture as well as credulity uh, not the most appropriate ones when looking at early modern phenomena. Uh, Eliab Feldon also proposed that there would not be a necessary relationship between increased accessibility to information provided by the press and a decreasing credulity, which we gener generally associate with lack of, of access to information. On the contrary, she states that printed news or stories could achieve an aura of proof by the mere, mere fact of being printed. Or uh, which, which the same information given orally or even in manuscript did not necessarily pass. Therefore, according to Eliab Feldon, it's not necessarily correct the current notion that with the print revolution, the so-called print revolution, and therefore the emergency of a new communication technology that enabled greater dissemination and rich information, people as a result, or as a logical result, would be able to better discern the true from the false. If we look, if we look at the present day, including or especially here in Brazil, uh, works as carried uh, as carried on by anthropologist Leticia Cesarino on the system of experts and information platforms regulated by algorithms, shows us, on the contrary, that cybernetics broke the paradigms that authorized the truth, creating new alternative circuits of communication and validation of, of what was true. Hence, the con contemporary phenomenon of fake news and the creation of a new lexicon to define what is fake or not. One might wonder if something similar might have happened in the 16th and 17th centuries. In this sense, it might be worth thinking about how the semantic descriptors of what would or would not be true, what would or would not look like fabled or fabulous in the sense of fiction, were presented and even more if there were variations according to different support and medium. Thus, following the path pointed by Elia uh, Feldon, we can browse dictionaries and lexicographical databases, such as Oxford English Dictionary or uh, LAM, uh, to get closer to the English vocabulary of the time to name the phenomenon of imposture and what we now, now call fake news. The first thing to highlight is that not only the expression fake news uh, uh, appeared for the first time in the late 19th century newspapers, but also the word fake is an 18th century term which came into current use in the English in the late 19th century. In this sense, there wasn't fake news. It couldn't be fake news in early modern times. However, the term false news was used since mid 16th century as an expression to signify the intention of spreading rumor lies, especially if directed to, a, uh, directed to attack someone's reputation. In this sense, it appeared in John Cowell's The Interpreter, or book containing the significant signification of words uh, from 1607. It is this, the interpreter is, is, is a, a, a vocabulary of legal terms, mainly. Uh, Scandalum magnatum, uh, and I read, is the special name of a wrong done uh, to any high personage, personage of the land as prelates, dukes, earls, barons, and other nobles, and also of the chancellor, treasurer, clerk of the privy seal, steward of the king's house, justice of the one bench or the other, and other great officers of the reign, realm by false news. The term charlatan from the Italian, uh, by other hand, uh, on, on the other hand, uh, and common in 19th century literature to describe the Sebastian of Venice and the likes, 
was more used in early modern times to describe someone talkative or even more specifically, a dishonest druggist or apothecary who tried to push him to sell some, uh, 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 to push him to push to sell some ineffective, ineffective drug. The terms impostor and pretender were, according to the dictionaries, the most recurrent expressions to describe charlatans in early modern English. This is confirmed by quickly looking uh, 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 by a quick look at the vocabulary used in the play Belief as You List uh, by Philip Massinger. Uh, I, I, uh, this, what I talk, will talk about, is based on, on partial results uh, of research uh, developed by my student Aline, Aline Davis Moreira, so to give the credit for research here. Uh, Believe as your list was written in this in the 1630s and therefore well well after the, the events of the fall Sebastian uh, of Venice. However, looking at the vocabulary of Messenger's plays serves as a strategy to simultaneously map the semantic field around the statues of credulity and veracity, as well as think about the changes in approach to the Sebastian's theme with the dynastic change. The play originally had uh, as, it, as its plot, the story of the Sebastian of Venice, most certainly using the narrative presented in the adventure pamphlets that I will now uh, deal with below. However, as Stuart England had diplomatic approach to Spain uh, in an attempt to reverse the anti-Hispanic, if not Hispanophobic, warlike stance of the Elizabethan period, the play was censored. In order not to lose the plot and most, like, most likely the contract uh, of the play, Messenger was forced to change the scenario. And from Venice, Portugal, and Spain of Philip III, the action was transferred to Rome and Syria of Antioch, Antiochus III, without, however, changing the core of the plot, the return of a hidden king who, has, who was lost and who, uh, uh, who went who, when he returned, was pursued by the usurper until the tragic outcome in which he was sentenced to death. What is ironic is that in the text of the play, even after the censorship, punctual re reference were left here and there to the case of Sebastian of Venice. And yet, it was finally authorized and staged by the King's Man Company at the Globe Theatre in 1631. The semantic field of the play uh, starting with the title Believe as Your List, involves the term believe and, and, and belief, which regulates the tension between the accusation of imposture directed to a pretender, but one who shows numerous proofs to say that uh, his cause was true. Terms such as false, falsehood, imposture, imposture, pretend, pretender, proof, prove, right, truth, truth, mark the dialogues of this Caroline drama. The semantic field in the place is always used in the disputation of one's beliefs. At the end of the play, sh but at the but the end of the play shows that tragically, being true does not mean being believed, and even being believed does not result in salvation or victory. This disjunctive, which always calls into question what is true, depending on how it is narrated and whether it is convincing appears in the three groups of sources that I'm going to analyze a little more closely now. I, I, I'm going to start with the first brief mention of Sebastian of Venice uh, case that I found in a printed text. Uh, it was in, uh, in 1599 satire of travel narratives, uh, Nash's Lenten stuff. Nash commented that in this in this pamphlet commented that the greedy sea, sea go ignorance of the common people and the rural fools was apt to devour anything, and therefore they the common people and the rural fools could believe in the declarations of a self-proclaiming new messiah in London. And I quote: "For a new messiah, they are ready to expect of the Bedlam hat maker's wife by London Bridge." He that proclaims himself Elias and saith he is inspired with mutton and porridge, and with then is the current is the current that Don Sebastian, King of Portugal, is slain twenty years since with Stuckley at the Battle of Alcacer, is raised from the dead like Lazarus and alive to be seen at Venice. 
according to Nash, Nash's Picarex description, only the common and rural peoples believed in the return of King Sebastian. And that kind of belief was not only recurrent, but a sign of their ignorance. But it was in John Chambler's letters to Dudley Carleton that I found the first mention of the Sebastian of Venice in a more nuanced perspective. In a letter dated uh, uh, from October 20th, 1598, just a few months after the fall Sebastian was discovered in Italy, uh, therefore, Chambler said that the news had arrived in London that a man in Venice, and, and I read, and I quote, a man in Venice professes to be Sebastian, late king of Portugal, not slain in the battle of, in Barbary, but taken prisoner and escaped. They say if he is so, he shall not want, want maintenance, not their mediation, but if not, he must look for what he deserves. Seeking to inform his friend Carleton about everything that was heard and talked in London, Chamberlain continued to mention the episode in his letters for another two years. From someone who uh, declares, uh, this is the expression uh, Chamberlain uses, used, uh, declares himself king and who must be investigated by this declaration and answer, answer for it if false or, or true. The Sebastian of Venice begins to be someone who is heard, be heard, having returned and having persuaded all of being the king and even having visited Prester John in Ethiopia as in a letter in, uh, from January 17th, uh, 1599, to finally be classified simply as a fable, uh, although a fable that remained much talk about in court, as he put it in, in, uh, in a letter by June, from June uh, 28th, 1599. On December uh, 20, 22nd, 6, uh, Six, uh, 1600, uh, the last mention of the case, uh, we found the last mention of the case. It is said that it was whispered, and I, I, I want to stress this word, that the revived king of Portugal was secretly at court, but he did not believe in that. The terms employed by Chamberlain indicate in part how this news or rumors were understood and dealt with, something that was heard murmured about, whispered, talked about, talked about a lot indeed, but overall something which circulated causing some to believe in it, even though it was most possibly a fable, that is fiction or even a lie. Stories, so stories of or false news when well told can persuade and therefore one should pay attention on them regardless being false or true, false or true. Interestingly, interestingly, these mentions of Sebastian of Venice appear amid descriptions of problems of precedence between French and English nobles at the Elizabeth court. News that arrive uh, uh, about the size of the Spanish king's co council or that, uh, that he was seeking peace. What aristocrat there was fallen from grace, from the king's grace, or even the quality of a newly printed book. Chamberlain, Chamberlain was what was called a Paul's Walker, that is, someone who frequented the St. Paul's Cathedral area for news, as this was the epicenter of rumors and news about the court and what was happening in the city, in the kingdom, and abroad. In this word of listening to what was said and commenting on what was heard, news about Sebastian of Venice circulated amid so many others. Chamberlain reported this news to his protege, Carleton, who was trying to gain posts in the court through diplomatic activity abroad and was relying on his friend, uh, Chamberlain, to keep himself informed of developments in London. The stories of Sebastian of Venice and whether he was in fact a disappeared king were not only the object of comment in London, at court and in the city, but were considered as valid news to be reported. If they were viewed by some with some suspicion, they would not be so different from other rumors that circulated, and therefore could or should be transmitted and commented on as pertinent information. But let's see. So, and finally, <laughs> second group of, of sources, uh, but the printed 
printed text most likely read by Gervasi Smith and which inspired two plays that I mentioned before. Between 16, 1601 and 1603, three pamphlets of the Sebastian of Venice were translated from, the, from French and printed in London. The strangest adventure that ever happened, the true history of the late and uh, lamentable adventures of Don Sebastian, King of Portugal, and a continuation of the lamentable and admirable adventures of Don Sebastian, King of Portugal. Apparently, they were compilations organized by the Dominican friar José Teixeira, a former Antonist, and a former Antonist supporter involved in the anti-Philippine struggle. Uh, who in France would rise to confessor to Catherine de Medici and advisor to the French king. These pamphlets were produced in defense of the Sebastian of Venice and contained letters, reports, news, prophecies, predictions, which sought to demonstrate on several fronts that this was the real Sebastian, the desired one, who had been hidden in North Africa in penance for his defeat in, uh, in Salah Kibir. In 1601, in the same year, let me, here, okay. uh, in, the, in 1601, the same year it came out in Paris, the first of these French pamphlets was translated into English by Anthony Monday and printed by Richard Field uh, in London under the title The Strange, uh, the Strange Adventure. It seems that the first pam pamphlet had some ed editorial success or some sponsorship, and the other French pamphlets that appear in 1602 were also translated. Uh, the first pamphlet, uh, Adventure Admirable, uh, uh, was also translated into Dutch and printed in Amsterdam in 60 1602, but only in England the three French pamphlets were translated and printed. Anthony Mande was a translator known for his versions of Iberian text, but rendering, render it, rendered it from French, uh, he, as far as we know, uh, didn't uh, know Spanish uh, or Portuguese. Uh, and among this, this Iberian text, text uh, uh, there, there were especially chivalric romances. And uh, he was, a, and Mundy was a relatively important figure in the Republic of Landers and in the Elizabethan Jacobean theater scene, having collaborated while writing plays for the company, uh, that Admiral's Man Company. It is very likely that this translation had to do with the staging of the play Sebastian, King of Portugal, which took place in the same year as the pamphlets printing and uh, pamphlets publishing, perhaps featuring a joint action to promote the play and pamphlet around the adventures of Sebastian of Venice. Monday possibly also translated the third pamphlet, a continuation from 1603, but it's not known who translated the second in the series, The True History. To think about the circuits of anglo iberian themes and translations uh, in England, uh, uh, an example with links to the case of, uh, uh, I, I, I want to show, oh, here, okay. I want to talk briefly about uh, uh, an example with links to the, to the case of Sebastian pamphlets, uh, Sebastian pamphlets is the 1598 English translation of Tract Paranitique, an anti Spanish text attributed to José Teixeira, the alleged author of the adventures. In addition to having been printed by Richard Field, the same printer of the two of the three pam pamphlets of the adventures of Sebastian, the first English edition of the, this anti-Hispanic treaty has two elements in, this, in his in paratext that are worth mentioning. First, the use of the expression now English, which would synthesize, according to Barbara Fox, uh, the mimetic process employed in the English translations, uh, early modern English translations of texts of Iberian origin, even if most of uh, those texts were translated from a language other than Spanish or Portuguese. And the dedication uh, to folk reveal an aristocrat, an important man of letters in Elizabethan circles, and known above all for his manuscript, posthumously printed of the life of Sydney and the Elizabeth court, in which Anglo-Iberian relations and disputes were prominent. 
like the pamphlet, the treated attribute to Cheda, had also been translated from French, and were most texts of uh, uh, as were most texts of Iberian origin printed in London. Uh, this indicates possible paths of the English circulation and reception of news debating information about the Iberian world. So everything probably went through France before uh, uh, reaching uh, London or, or, or England. It would not be possible to discuss in depth the topic of translation, but following the footsteps of Bell and Hosington, I would like to, to, to look uh, at the paratextual elements of the adventurous pamphlets as central ones to the to think uh, printed translations. In this sense, it's important to look as a, uh, to the, at the title pages. As the printed texts were not sold with a book cover, it was through the title pages that their content was communicated for the potential buyers and readers. The title page served as a sales, so-called a publishing strategy or sales strategy, when displayed in the stores of, or stalls of the booksellers who sold them. Although the title page of the English prints does not uh, uh, defer much, the English editions does not defer much from the la layout of the French editions, as you, you can see here, some expressions and emphasis uh, which appear in the, in the titles may help to think about the statues of veracity and credulity. So, uh, I would like to stress the expression, the strangest adventure ever happened, histories, uh, adventure ad admirable, lamentable, adventures, true history, etc. Uh, that are highlighted there. Uh, I did uh, an initial research in the EBO and ESTC databases uh, uh, to see if some of these highlighted terms uh, that you are seeing are recurrent in other prints between the years 1590s and 1610s. Even though it was a preliminary exercise, there were some interesting returns to think about the semantic field. Uh, 40, 48 prints uh, appeared uh, with adventure in the title, many linked to military, military battles, uh, 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 battles of nobles and knights, and above all, chivalric romances or heroic deeds. Uh, Forty with admirable uh, in the title, but of those, only 13 were related to or qualify some news or story or narrative. Uh, one with two prints, uh, 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 two editions, included, including strange and admirable. The expression, expression admirable adventures appeared together only in the Sebastian pamphlet of 1602 and even separated in the title only in two other prints. Now, strange adventures appeared together in eight titles in addition to eight other prints where the two words appeared uh, even uh, separate, separated in the title. However, the 6001 pamphlet title is The Strangers Adventure. Uh, that is, superlative, superlative is singular, not strange adventures, but the strangest adventure. It's worth remember that in, in the French pamphlet from which strangers, the strangest adventure was drawn, the expression was adventure admirable as repeated in the 1602 pamphlet. In turn, the expression true history or histories, which follows the French title, appears more in historical chronicles and in a more political sense. And the title page, the adjective strange, admirable, uh, uh, qualified terms such, uh, such as adventure, discovery, accidents, novelties, voyage, while it is famous that appears more linked to history and news, which therefore brings the historical genre closer to the news and leaving the novelty novelties for what is strange and admirable, as well as accidental. True, however, appear for both fields. In other words, from these titles, the qualification of truth would not be linked to the type of report, whether more fantastic or more newsworthy or more historical, or to a certain genre, 
travel history news, but it would be an adjective used to ensure that it was true and therefore credible, and thus deserved to be purchased, consumed, and read. It seems to me that the type of meaning evoked by the terms strange, admirable, adventure, when combined, would refer to the universe of chivalric romance, chanson de geste, and heroic deeds, less than uh, the, to the word of news, uh, even wonderful or miraculous one. In the same way that true history or true histories, uh, even if it could lead to news, it would be more related to the field of historical chronicle. This can indicate a type of reception, a desire or implicit reader of the adventures pamphlets. That is, someone who will consume it, or consume them, more as a fictional or poetic reading, in which history would also enter as a rhetorical poetical genre, than as news of an event. This takes on uh, an even more theatrical meaning when we uh, read the title of a play attributed to Shakespeare that contains virtually all of all the terms. The late and much admired play called Pericles, Prince of Tyre, with the true relation of the whole history, adventures, and fortunes of the said prince, as also the no, uh, the no read strange and worthy accidents in the birth and life of his daughter, Mariana. Uh, thus, truth and verisimilitude in the pamphlets of the adventures of King Sebastian would be closer to the dramatic genre of the play about Sebastian, King of Portugal, staged in 1601, than to the informative reports that circulated in a letter as in Chamberlain's, circulated by letters as in, as in uh, Chamberlain's letters. And what about uh, uh, this in news that may inform political decisions? Perhaps thinking about this kind of information circuit uh, uh, related to the political realm of decisions, in a letter to Robert Cecil, one of his agents wrote, and I quote, there is a Spanish saying that although the reporter of the news is a fool, the hearer ought to be wise and discern the substance thereof before he gives it further passage. If all would do so, Her Majesty and you would not be so often uh, uh, troubled. Uh, all, all the citations now uh, came from uh, calendar, uh, state, state papers or, or Cecil papers. By the interpretation of the Spanish saying, the retransmission of news reported by fools when not verified would generate problems in this case for the government of Elizabeth I and her secretary. And that was what perhaps commonly occurred as those coming from St. Paul's area. However, when looking at the mentions of the case of Sebastian of Venice in the document documentation of the reign of Elizabeth I and even James I, uh, what defined the discernment about the substance or matter of the news was guided by a type of prudence and wisdom that was not always informed exclusively, exclusively informed by the veracity of the narrative. And here I enter finally uh, in the third uh, uh, group of sources. Uh, there are references of, to Sebastian of Venice in the calendars uh, of the state papers and such, uh, a few reference uh, to Sebastian of Venice in the calendars of the state papers and such papers. In addition to uh, two letters sent by Sebastian of Venice supporters that uh, uh, I should analyze in, in, in other occasion, uh, I found about uh, a dozen reference, uh, generally brief, in letters from ambassadors or reports from English agents or various subjects, uh, uh, on, agents on various subjects between the years 1598 and 1605. In this documentation, uh, in the sources, uh, generally addressed to Cecil, it seems to me that it mattered more to report what was happening in Italy and in Spain than to question or even verify whether Sebastian of Venice was in, in fact the lost king of, uh, on the battle, uh, of, uh, on Salic Kibir battle. It was often highlighted what the reappearance, appearance or reappearance of King Sebastian was causing on the minds of the people in Portugal and how, and this was important, it was stirring up fears in Spain. If we put together these brief mentions, first with a, a passage about what having, a, a, again, a Portuguese king in Lisbon could cause in terms of the European political uh, 
uh, uh, realignment, especially, especially in relation to France and England against Spain, and secondly, with reference here and there to issues of the Portuguese throne and even the British crown succession, we may have a bigger picture to understand the approach towards the diplomatic or, go or the crown's approach towards Sebastian of Venice's case. Perhaps the stone more preoccupied with following what more preoccupied with following what was happening was part of a political calculation that was less caring about the truth of the Sebastian cause and more concerned with the possible dynastic and political implications. Maybe mainly the interest resided within, within the range of possibilities of increasing the English sphere of influence over a, over a Spain that had just lost a king, Philip II, who died in 1598 and was the nemesis of uh, Elizabeth, Elizabethan England. But during the reign of James I, and, and here there is a kind of plot twist here, uh, Cecil wrote a letter directly addressed to the secretary of the Council of Detain of, uh, of the Council of Detain of Venice, Piero Pellegrini, seeking to ascertain the facts about the pretender, as he knew, uh, since he knew uh, about the power, uh, and I quote, the power of a passionate desire over people, which makes them re readily believe anything which leads to their uh, uh, interest or promises vengeance on an enemy. And Cecil did not intend to give credence to these assertions or to reject them without inquiry. Therefore, he asked for the opinion of the, on the matter of the secretary, person of judgment, this is important, it's a person of judgment, and with importance in the prudent, uh, uh, I, I, I think that this, this qualification is important here, a uh, prudent senate of Venice. By this, by this, he suppose he want to establish a profitable, profitably exchange information. So in not taking a stand or affirming that the mere exchange of information could uh, 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 be fruitful, Cecil emphasized his own prudence and also indicated that he was not ruled by his passion since he was a man of civility or urbanity as more common in, in 17th century Italian. Uh, and a man of po politics who could seize the occasion properly as in Alciato's emblem. And with that, distinguish himself from people who let uh, uh, themselves be governed by desires and affections. Here, it was important to check the foundations of the reports in a dispassionate way in order to prudently make the most profitable decision. But the peculiar thing about this undated letter is that from the dating indicated in the Cecil papers, that's not from the letter, but it's attributed after, uh, it, would have, it would have been written as late as 1605, when the case was closed, since Catizoni, the false Sebastian of Venice, had been executed by the Castilians in 1603. I haven't yet had access to the original letter, only to, to the transcriptions in the Cecil papers calendars and haven't found mentions to this correspondence looking uh, into the calendars of state papers covering uh, the archives of Venice. But Piero Pellegrini was still secretary of the Diece in 16, 1605, which make, makes possible for Cecil uh, to write a letter to him, uh, even in, this, uh, uh, in that late date. Could it be that only in 1605 Cecil decides to decided to ask uh, 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 for an authoritative version, uh, opinion about what happened and separate what were our beliefs, readily believe, and desire, passionate desire, from the facts? Perhaps because at the time there was no more way to bet on the benefits uh, from these passions and little gain uh, uh, came, uh, may come uh, from that. Uh, 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 it would in the scenario of Anglo-Iberian dis disputes, perhaps because of that. If we think from the perspective of reason of state, it would make sense since with the death of Elizabeth I and the coronation of James I in 1603, there was a radical change in, political in the political relations with Spain, seeking not only peace, which already announced itself from the late 15 1590s on, but also 
uh, also the attempt to establish alliance with the Philip III of Spain. In short, from the perspective of government and foreign policy, the truth or the lie of the narratives was tempered by interests go governed by the prudence of reason of state. However, it's not without irony that one year later, the same Robert Sasser would be hearing again about Sebastian of Venice, now in the investigation of Gervais Smith's messianic prophecies to oust the very James I and to put in his throne in his throne, a hidden king, not Sebastian I, but Edward VI, also returned from Africa. In the examples I selected here, the veracity of news was weighed by other aspects, and the space for doubting whether or not to believe in it uh, was ordered by the cr criteria of circulation and use of the news, less than by considering its veracity a value on itself, as we tend to do. Uh, in contemporary times. The question remains to know what the effects of the circulation are, as well as to think more carefully about the intention of those who circulated this news within the political disputes in the tense years of transition from the Elizabeth reign to the beginning of the Stuart dynasty and uh, the relation of that with the Anglo-Iberian relations. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy Lippi, for such an interesting uh, presentation talk. Uh, I'm opening the floor for questions now. So if anyone wants to ask anything, please use the raise hand function or type in the chat, please. Any questions? I have a few, but I don't want to be the first. <laughs> Luciana, were you <laughs> raising your, your hand? Yes. I think you're still muted. I was still muted, thank you. Thank you, um, Veronica, thank you, Felipe, for this um, really nice, well-researched talk. I wanted to um, come back a little bit to, the, to your starting point, to the question of whether or not um, you're dealing with fake news. And um, <clears throat> your concluding remarks, well, um, <clears throat> to me, uh, articulate a kind of Machiavellian approach to truth. So whatever the use may be is what truly matters. The use that um, news is um, serving. Um, perhaps, uh, you could um, elaborate a little bit on that and and contrast it to our notion of fake news. Um, and and I think this is somehow related to another remark you made um, <clears throat> in the beginning of your talk regarding the different technologies, the technology of print, and the digital technology, particularly the platforms and social media. Um, <clears throat> and that um, the faith of certain historians regarding um, the dissemination of print, for instance, that um, like Chartier um, and many others, um, um, the way they narrate the so-called print revolution is um, well, there are more books, more readers, more reading lead to um, more skepticism towards um, king and God, so towards authority. Um, and um, however, it's a kind of negative uh, argument because there isn't, we aren't told much about the reconstitution of authority. So what i'm wondering is if you were if you plan to if you're interested in looking at specific practices uh, associated with print so if you are if you imagine yourself dealing with one specific case of a printer and translate on the circulation of that given manuscript to gain insight into uh, these 
uh, new practices uh, that the print medium enabled. And, and perhaps that, that would, could also be um, obliquely a more illuminating for us to understand uh, the use we make of digital media. Because it's not the medium, the technology in itself, but also uh, the way we manipulate it and use it. It's a little confused, but I have a, a, a sense that a feeling that you, you, you got the two points. I go now? Yes, okay. please. Yeah. Uh, so, there are great questions. Thank you. Uh, let me see if I can address them properly. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to, to start with the latter. Uh, I, I agree with you that that uh, you you have two main uh, positions or, or towards the print revolution. One that okay, this is uh, uh, more information, more knowledge, more. Uh, 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 criticism, more uh, democracy, and, and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. The other is uh, more printing, more circulation, more skepticism, more uh, 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 the, the destruction of uh, the institutions or the credibility of some institutions. Uh, so both of them uh, are based on the fact that uh, 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 the print revolution or, or, or the presence of uh, uh, print attacks and a broader circulation of, of information caused for good or for bad, neg positively or negatively, uh, effects uh, uh, that uh, almost uh, uh, in a, a, a necessary way uh, uh, create the foundations of modernity. So it, it, it's a bit of te teleological. In, 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 in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to like more about uh, 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 the negative argument, uh, because I think that that is more, uh, 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 it has some kind of, of, of relation with what we are living now, we are facing now. So, uh, uh, and, and the idea that uh, uh, undue a new kind of, of, of technology of information uh, requires or, or imposes uh, a change of the uh, uh, circuit or, or the, the machinery of giving authenticity, authenticity or veracity to the information. So if you have, uh, 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 if, if, you, if you change the way information uh, circulates, you change the uh, uh, instances of saying this or that is true, uh, this or that is false, it's, it's a lie. Uh, but however, I think that, that you, ha you have a, a really good point, that is, this is maybe too theoretical, because it, it's, it's, it only looks uh, to information as a, an abstract system. So uh, as a system with, uh, uh, so we are, we are all, always uh, thinking about uh, abstract examples and trying to, to make a diagram of it. And, and I think that you have, you, you are completely uh, 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 correct in, uh, uh, in stating that one should look to concrete cases to test both or other hypotheses, uh, and even to talk to think about our, our times. Uh, I think that that in this in this particular case, the uh, 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 principle or, or or the most favorable uh, uh, source to do that uh, is uh, uh, the, uh, the the adventures pamphlets, because I have. 
uh, 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 several levels of uh, 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 kinds of, of, of sources. I have the French edition, I have the English edition, I have Portuguese manuscripts uh, that uh, have had some of those prophecies of or, or letters or something like that. So it, it, it's it's it, you one it's possible to compare compare what is translated, how is translated, uh, 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 which words were used were employed, and, and, and so forth. And also uh, as there is this this. Uh, 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 Production of plays, and at the same time, and it, okay, this is this is a small, uh, tiny, uh, almost ridiculous small uh, 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 mention uh, uh, of the of the pamphlets in, in, in Jarvis's uh, uh, investigation. But we have some hints of circulation. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the the plays I don't remember if uh, uh, one of the plays uh, that that narr narrated the uh, Sarah Kibir uh, uh, battle uh, that was I think uh, it was I don't remember which one oh, but one of them uh, had a whole dialogue that is quite similar to a passage of a. Uh, 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 the first, I think, of the adventurous pamphlets. And the end of the play was uh, 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 staged in theory for the first time, uh, in theory, but for the first time before uh, uh, the publishing of the pamphlets. But as the printed version that we have of the play is from 60, 16 something, that is, after the circulation of, of the pamphlets, it's quite likely that they adapted, they changed the playbook uh, uh, because of uh, 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 the news of Sebastian of Venice and incorporated part of the narrative presented uh, by the, the, the adventures, the strangers. I, I guess it's the strangers adventure and I think it's the Battle of Alcázar. I don't remember, uh, but I have this uh, right now uh, at some point. So I think that it's possible to think uh, in these terms. And then we have Richard Field, that is a, 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 a printer uh, known for uh, printing uh, translations and texts from uh, Iberian, uh, uh, from Iberia, so Iberian sources. He was, uh, 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 he was, uh, 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 he, he, he worked with a French Huguenot printer that imported uh, several types uh, uh, wood blocks and whatsoever from France. And some of them were used in the adventures pamphlets and are exactly the same or very similar to the French pamphlets. So it's, it's interesting to, to, to compare them and see, okay, not only the disposition is similar, of, of the title page and, and inside uh, uh, including, but also some elements, uh, typographic elements are not necessarily the same, but almost identical. Uh, so it's, it's possible to understand and then understand how the news, how the information circulated and how it in this circulation, it changes. So uh, I, I think that, that this is possible. Uh, I, I have to go to, back to the archives and to, to libraries. The problem is that uh, this research uh, is on hold for the, for the last two years. So I, I, I'm trying to elaborate uh, in, in theoretical terms <laughs> and not empirical terms. So everything I'm, I have done in, in the last two years are uh, looking at this on, on the screen, uh, a text on the screen, uh, sources on the screen. I, I, I don't, uh, I, I didn't, didn't have the opportunity to, to, to fill a book or a source <laughs> materially in, in two years time so that that's that's a problem uh, I, I don't know if I've, i answered your second question uh, I'm, I'm not sure if i can answer it, to be honest but that that's that's the way I, i'm thinking about it uh about the machiavellian approach to the truth yeah th 
that that's odd to to hear. Uh, in theory, I, I I I wasn't aware of that actually. But you are right. I I think that that the end of my my presentation goes into that direction. So uh, uh, and I think that 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 is not necessarily the best way to approach it. Uh, well, I think it is. I think it's great because it's a rhetorical. Um, well, it's to think about politics in rhetorical terms, very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? In terms of, of of politics, but not in terms of the the other uh, uh, sources. Uh, for, for instance, I'm thinking about why uh, uh, Mondays uh, uh, Monday was so interested in publishing. And, and translating and, and working with Admiral's Mem uh, 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 and, and print the, uh, the Strangers' Adventure, for instance. Uh, I think that one possibility is not it's not necessarily a, a, a political endeavor, but also a, 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 it, it's inserted in a, a in a in a patronage patronage system because. He dedicated the, the the pamphlet to the mayor of London and some aldermen and and some uh, individuals that were very important in in in, in the guilds uh, in Guide Hall and whatsoever. So and this was kind of a shift in his career. Uh, he uh, uh, started to work not in the court or for the court seeking. Uh, 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 favors from the court or from nobles, from the aristocratic circles, and started to work for the city. And this was a great uh, uh, move from him. Uh, so I think that um, in, in some way, uh, uh, for instance, in the case of the uh, of Monday, uh, I, I have to look not only in terms of uh, politics or uh, anti-Hispanic uh, uh, tendencies, or things like that, but also how he and Richard Field, for instance, operate operated uh, uh, in terms of a, a web of favors and and and, and uh, patronage and, and things like that. Yeah, but then yeah, but you then have to make a pamphlet. <laughs> you could make, <laughs> make other things. Other things. Interesting yeah. Interesting aspect, mm -hmm. aspect is that it is a pamphlet. So yeah, there yeah. is the yeah. formation of, of a public realm yeah. interested mm -hmm. in and the circulation of pamphlets and a European mm -hmm. network okay. as well yeah. that emerges. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, 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 that's a good aspect. I, I, I haven't thought about it. Yeah. Uh, I have to think that, that, that that's that's something really important to think about why a pamphlet. So uh, uh, I keep saying this for, uh, to my students, but now I, I see that I, I didn't do my homework. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I don't know if if, uh, if I answered uh, everything. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I want to make one of my own while people are still thinking about that. Uh, so Bruno will be <laughs> the next one. It's just a short question. Um, Mine as well. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I was just wondering when you uh, showed the um, frequency of appearance of the terms, such as adventures and all of that. Uh, have you? I don't know if you had the chance to check uh, if those taxes were translations as well or not, or if they were original in English. Because I was thinking, if I don't know, some of those words seem a little odd to the places that they were located. So was that something that was echoing the original text in French or in any other language? I was wondering if, well, that is something in the title, but. Uh, also across the, the publications and the decisions that the translator um, had to make. Uh, did, how could you evaluate that? Uh, I didn't, actually. Uh, I'm doing that. <laughs> this, this, this is a, a good question. I'm doing that, uh, actually. Uh, uh, she's not here, but Beatrice uh, 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 is doing part of this. Uh, st will 
start doing this with some of uh, some of one some pamphlets. But this this is this is a, 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 a something to to look into. Uh, okay, this is about the, the printed text uh, the translations. I guess this is this is something that that uh, it's it's fundamental for for the rest of, of research. Uh, um, so I, I don't have now a, a good answer for that, except uh, uh, with the exception that this this is really important and and and, and, and uh, but I don't have great examples, for instance, uh, about it. Uh, one thing that I started to do uh, is to compare some other texts of Monday with the translation and to see uh, some options. For instance, he. Uh, one author says that uh, Tracy Hill, uh, that, that, that wrote uh, uh, about uh, Anthony Monday and civic culture, uh, uh, she, she mentioned the, the, the pamphlet promoting a London mayor that, that uh, Ariel Hessayon Ariel uh, 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 wrote uh, uh, in, the, in the chat. She says that Monday has the, uh, had the habit of putting an extra E and doubling any letter possible. Uh, and this is not, uh, and this was apparently, according to Tracy Hill, a decision made by Monday, not by the printer, because uh, different printers uh, publishing, uh, printing Monday's text uh, had the same pattern, used the same pattern. Uh, uh, and this is something that according to Tracy Hill, and I'm trying to, to verify it, if, if this is uh, possible, uh, uh, he has this, this habit uh, that is that, okay, this habit is common in, in 16th and 17th century uh, 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 printed text, but uh, it, it seems that Monday is uh, really enjoy, enjoyed uh, uh, doubling letters, uh, putting E's at the end and things like that. Uh, I, I'm using this to see if the third pamphlet, for instance, is from, mon from, from Monday or not. And I'm trying to do something, so trying to, to immerse myself in Monday's language uh, uh, to see if this uh, rings a bell or not, uh, this, whether this rings a bell or not. Uh, I, I'm, and a second, uh, 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 step would be, will be comparing the translation. I, I read the, the French pamphlets, so, but I don't know, three, four years, actually, for the first time, the first time was 10 years ago, something like that, I, don't, I really don't remember, but I have now to, to really compare them and see which kind of, of uh, options were made, uh, which kind of vocabulary was used and simply translated and things like that. So this this is this is a work to do. Uh, I, I hope I, I manage to do this before the end of uh, before finishing the, the 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 research project because the project goes until October. So until October, I have to finish everything. <laughs> Fingers crossed, <laughs> Bruno. Hi, all. Well, uh, Luis Felipe. Uh, I found your, your your talk quite interesting, and I have just three questions for you. Um, when you talk about a system of experts, I do not understand precisely if you are agreeing with that or not. If you are, I would I, I would like to hear from you about which kind of experts experts were involved in the in the in the story that you are studying right now um, if there were experts in involved in the plays and in the letters because when you show us when, when you show us the uh, a letter to Sassu, it was mentioned it was mentioned uh, that they talk about blah, 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 blah. And who were they? Uh, which kind of people were involved in, into, trans, into transmitting this story forward? 
the second question I have is about is about grouping. Um, if if you are not talking about about truth as something as something something that it is in the news, but something that changes according to circulation. Uh, I would like to hear from you again if you could identify some some groups that were formed around those stories, because I'm thinking parallel in parallel with uh, something of our age like Quiwanon, that you know people they they consume the, those kind of news they they create their groups they walk together they talk the same things well you could find something like that in the in the early 17th century or not and finally I, um when you were talking i was thinking if those kind of stories they were you know, there were a business. If people could pro could make a good profit from it, and if and if existed um, another other place with other imposters in the same time uh, being being played in in England, that's all. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, system of exports. This is a, a, a rough translation of uh, Leticia Cesarino's terms. Uh, 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 sistema, no, it's, it's more complex. Than, it's not Sistema de Peritos, but it's something like that. So I, I translated this. This is, I, I, I've, I've tried to find it in, in her articles in English if the expression appeared, uh, uh, but uh, I just found it in 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 her uh, articles in Portuguese. Uh, so I think that uh, um, this is something that I'm I'm really thinking about. Uh, 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 what what the idea of this system of exports? It's the people or the institutions or a system that could authorize something to give authority to some information to some facts and, and things like that so for instance in, in our times science was a system of exports uh, uh, the news uh, outlets the, uh, the press was a system of exports and things like that the government in theory or some institutions uh, 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 related or, or, or uh, part of the government of the state uh, were part of, of created a system of exports. So why am I putting this in, in, in the past? Because according to Lestisa Cesarino, this new uh, uh, system of communication mediated by the algorithms, by the cybernetics uh, uh, and things like that, uh, is eroding the system of exports. Uh, so this is the system of exports. I think that in 16th, 17th century, uh, the system of experts that uh, existed was also under erosion, and they were creating other systems of experts. For instance, uh, and here I, I'm following in, in a way uh, 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 Darton's idea about censorship. Censorship is a system of experts. For instance, Darton, uh, Darton says that uh, uh, in France, uh, censors were, uh, he used uh, uh, this word, this expression uh, 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 ironically, but they, they were literary critics. Uh, they, they were uh, not only uh, censoring what, what should or should not be published because it, it would cause turmoil, because it's offensive, but uh, they were uh, uh, given authority in terms of literature or literary terms for some texts. So in this sense, censorship could be understood 
uh, as a system of experts. Uh, so the uh, academies uh, uh, that were created in six in, from 15, 15th century on could be understand again as a system of experts. And sometimes in some places, this, uh, this academic system is created, was created, uh, I, I don't, I, not necessarily against, but apart from the universitary uh, system of experts. Uh, and so in some places clashed, there were clashes between the academic uh, or the academic in terms of the academia's uh, uh, system of expert and the university system, system of experts. So this is, the, this is the thing that I'm thinking about uh, system of experts. So, and I think that the printing press uh, uh, eroded the, the idea of, of eroded, uh, 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 I think that the, be the, better, the best example for this is not uh, in England, it's in France. So uh, uh, the University of Sorbonne has had uh, the privilege of controlling the information on manuscripts that's that circulated on manuscript in theory of course but Sorbonne had the function uh, uh, of controlling and and authorizing all the manuscript that circulated in uh, the reign of France but at some point with the printed uh, and uh, Sorbonne uh, uh, inherited uh, so to, so to call this uh, uh, attribution when the, uh, or it was created another attribution when the print and press uh, became so popular. So Sorbonne incorporated the printed press in its uh, authoritative, authoritative uh, uh, system of experts. But uh, in the late 16th century, and especially during the 17th century, the crown created a specific, a, a, a proper and a specific uh, uh, system of authorization of texts through privileges, uh, uh, granting privilege of printing, but also creating a, 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 a censorship uh, uh, of the crown. So, and, and then we have, uh, uh, this is an example of a role, uh, the erosion of one system of experts and the, the assumption of uh, an ascension, sorry, uh, of another system of experts. And I think that the 16th and 17th century uh, in England, the things are, weren't so clear. But here, I, this is this is a hypothesis. I don't know. I don't have the necessary uh, 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 scholarship to state this uh, boldly. So. So this this is the, the, the I, I I'm borrowing uh, 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 the Leticia Cesarino term to not not to think not to use but to provoke some thought uh, regarding to look into 16th and 17th century in in a way it's 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 a kind of of continual debate with uh, 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 Foucault's uh, uh, article conference. Uh, 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 about what is the author. So I, I, I continue. I'm, I'm, I'm continuing my, my discussion with my imaginary discussion with Foucault. So that 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 that, that that's the. So we, we could we could ask what is the function of the censor? What what is the function of uh, the printer? What is the function of the uh, I don't know the uh, Publisher, the the bookseller, and so on. So this is this is the, the whole point. Uh, which groups? That's a good question. Uh, about the English part of the reception of the news, I don't know, to be honest. I suppose that, for instance, in the case of of Gervas Smith, Gervas Smith, there was a group of Puritans uh, that maybe uh, uh, had some kind of uh, system of information uh, that uh, uh, could uh, derived in millenarian messianic 
proposals, uh, anti-Catholic, uh, 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 anti-Jacobian uh, uh, actions, and, and so forth. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm, but I don't have uh, uh, enough data to 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 state that. I know, but for in the case of the Sebastianists, that is the people that produced the documents, the sources that were translated first in French and then in English. Uh, this is this is I I I I, I could be bold and say and 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 say something like that. It's it's quite similar to QAnon, <laughs> if you want. <laughs> So they have a kind of network of information. They correspond uh, 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 with several people. They, 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 they exchange information. They read the same things. Uh, in, in the 6040s and the 6050s, I'm trying to do the same thing, uh, 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 but looking into Anglo-Iberian relations. And I think in that case, it's, it's more likely to find uh, 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 this kind of, of, of formation or groups, uh, not only because those groups were more uh, better studied, both for British and Luso-Brazilian scholarship, but also because I, I find, uh, I, I think that it's possible to see the connections more clearly. And also because I know a little bit more about 1640s and 1650s in Portugal uh, uh, and the Portuguese Empire than I know about uh, late uh, uh, 16th century and early 17th century in, uh, in Portugal. So it, it, part of the job I, I, I already did. So this is the, the thing. The third question is about the, the business aspect of it. Yes. So uh, what this this I think it, it, it's something that I I I, I Sometimes I, I, I tend to overemphasize the uh, uh, political aspects, and sometimes I, de I, I, I realize that I emphasize uh, a, bit, a little bit too much the uh, 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 market aspects of uh, the enterprise. So for instance, I think that one thing that is really important is the networks uh, created by, for instance, Monday and Richard Field. Uh, with uh, the court, uh, Earl of Oxford, uh, the mayor of London, the fishmongers, uh, and things like that. With uh, uh, Monday was a draper, he was part of, of uh, he was a draper, if I'm not mistaken, oh, I have to check. Uh, uh, he has good relations with uh, 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 several stationaries, members of, of the stationary company. So I think that, uh, and he, and this is this we we, we have to to look into. He had a, 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 a strong presence in the dramatic scene uh, of uh, of uh, Elizabeth and Jacobean uh, uh, London, uh, and then he was uh, uh, responsible for uh, the city parades. I don't think this is the, the, the right name. Uh, so he, he wrote and projected several uh, 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 parades of uh, library companies or wrote uh, about it. So I think that, that uh, Lord Mayo shows, thank you, Ariel. Uh, uh, so he, he uh, we have to look into this more material aspect of the production of these pamphlets and the circulation of uh, of the news uh, i i my i intend to that, that 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 that's my my ambition to uh cross uh this different layers so for instance think in terms of the political the more political aspect the uh, uh, aspect of the networks and and and, and the, the the information network, how uh, the information from France uh, got into London in England, and and what what uh, which are the material, the concrete connection that allow uh, 
allows the, allow the information to get from here to there, and which persons uh, are involved, uh, and the uh, uh, the aspect of uh, let's put it this way the representation of of some uh, uh, topics of some uh, common places and how they were uh, embedded in uh, early modern culture and. Uh, uh, and OK, I'm back. And uh, uh, at last but not at least, uh, uh, the economic or material aspects of it. Someone has to uh, eat. And to do so, he has to have connections, to have has earnings and things like that. And this uh, is uh, 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 built within a logic of uh, an, of patronage, of 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 uh, 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 gift economy of the gift, so to to use uh, most expressions and things like that. So my intention, my pretension, <laughs> my ambition is to cross all these aspects in when analyzing the sources. I'm not sure if I will, uh, I would be able to do it, but this is this is the the, the hypothesis. So, and the problem is that sometimes I emphasize one aspect and, and because I, I'm studying this aspect, but, but in, in theory, I, I hope that at the end I, I can uh, uh, put everything together. Ariel. Thank you, Luis Felipe. That was uh, fascinating, thought provoking. Uh, and just in the response to the questions, I could take what I was originally going to ask in several different directions. I'm going to bring you back to two points that have been constantly emphasized, truth and expertise. And it's sort of a question come comment. The first is while modern analogies are very helpful, obviously, to non-specialists, it does take us away from what's different about early modern England. And we need to think of truth not as a singular thing, but as a diff there are a whole variety of different types of notions of what constitutes truth and almost a hierarchy of different types of truth. The most important obviously being biblical truth and doctrinal truth. And their counterparts would of course be, for example, error, error or heresy. Then you might have the political truth, the arcana imperi, the, the secrets of state. And so I'm encouraging you to think about truth in a more nuanced way rather than just as an absolute. As, as something that's flexible and in relation to what you're pushing it against. And with expertise, this is obviously a modern concept of experts, but as there's an association between expertise and authority. But in the period and the discussion, that authority comes in different directions. And one of the things that perhaps I might encourage you to think about is how authority can stem from honor, from social status, from wisdom, from age. The, you know, Keith Thomas is excellent about this on age and authority. So where you are, your gender, all of these things can impact upon your authority to speak truth. And obviously a great deal of work has been done on propaganda in the English Revolution and how contemporaries used various devices to give credibility to narratives that purported to tell one version of truth rather than another, whether it be a battlefield account, a political gossip, a new prophet or prophetess, whatever it may be. And some of them were fictitious, it doesn't matter, but they used devices to give the impression to readers that they, their account, their narration was credible. So if you look at their strategies and see what strategies are happening just 40, 40 years before, you can see, is there, because one of your bigger questions is, you know, is there a shift in strategy or are the strategies the same? We certainly see a shift in strategy post restoration, particularly with the advent of the Royal Society, where you have the use of Baconian scientific method. That gives you a form of using a truth because you can say that you are not personally invested, you're disinterested in the truth that you're producing because it's been produced from an impartial scientific methodology. So you do have the development of a new type 
a method of claiming a truth, even if, of course, your experiment is faulty, the experimenter can at least claim that they're trying to do it. And finally, on the sensors, two points. One is Anthony, Anthony Milton's excellent point on his work on censorship, is that we shouldn't think of censorship as something that's hard and fast and inflexible. Sometimes censors moderate or modulate a work. They they act literally, to use Danson's idea, literary critics, by excising just the most problematic passages or asking for a softening rather than banning the whole book or destroying the whole book. So that there, there's a more of a flexibility there. And also in a Protestant context, and Milton and Areopagiticus famous for this, there is a consciousness, particularly amongst those who favor religious toleration, not to push the idea of censorship too far, because then they are, of course, mimicking the practices of the Inquisition. So they are deliberately disassociating themselves from that. And the idea is a plurality of voices, provided that you attach your reputation, your credit to that voice and take the punishment with it. And I mean, going back to, I think Bruno and others have been mentioning QAnon. If anonymity is removed, people, the theory would be, would be more responsible about what they say because there are repercussions. So I hope there were some questions in there. But <laughs> whatever the case, that was a really sort of great and stimulating talk. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you, Ariel. Uh, uh, I think that, that uh, uh, we have a First, we have actually a hierarchy of, of, of what is truth. Uh, so in terms of in theological terms, uh, some uh, interpretations of truth, uh, uh, the only possible truth, absolute truth, is God. Uh, the rest uh, uh, is uh, uh, just probabilities uh, of truth. So uh, in, in in, in a uh, Thomistic Aristotelian uh, 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 doctrine, uh, for instance, it's impossible to know for with certainty the truth, because knowing the truth with certainty, knowing in terms of by the reason, uh, is something that only uh, uh, it's possible when you are with God. Uh, so uh, you you only have possibility of knowing. So it's pro you only have probability of being certain of something. So I agree with you. Uh, uh, and, and and even in in in, in things like uh, uh, the Holy Office uh, uh, jurisdiction and, and jurisprudence, uh, the Holy Office, uh, the Inquisition, never. Uh, 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 discuss the concept of truth. The Inquisition discuss uh, both uh, Roman, uh, 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 Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition uh, discuss uh, the practices or condemn or, or persecute the practices uh, that are heretical, not the ideas uh, uh, or the, the concepts that are heretical in terms of this is true or not, but the uh, outcome of the ideas. So, uh, uh, the, so what I'm saying is, is uh, the ma the matter is m more of the practices than that knowing the truth. Because knowing the truth uh, in absolute terms, it's impossible for humans. Uh, in theological terms. And I think that uh, this is quite different from political truth. And, and this, uh, 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 and I think that, that this has actually a rhetorical, political uh, approach and, and Machiavellian uh, approach uh, of, to the truth in, in this sense, uh, uh, not Machiavellian like. Uh, 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 so in terms of a reason of state, whether it's Christian, Protestant, uh, Catholic, uh, or Republican, but the idea that there is some kind of uh, uh, um, uh, Tacitian aspects of the means may justify 
the ends may justify the mean. Uh, the ends may justify the end may justify the means. Uh, that is something that is in Tacitus before it would be uh, uh, it it was attributed to uh, uh, Machiavelli. So I think that that I, I have to and I, I agree with you. There are several levels of truth, and I think that this is maybe the biggest difference between our uh, idea of truth from the Enlightenment on, maybe, uh, uh, an early modern idea of truth. For uh, in, in Western societies, there is only uh, uh, one way or one possibility of truth, that's the scientific rational truth, uh, and or based on this uh, construct of uh, 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 the science, the the uh, universal ideas and things like that. Of course, there are uh, 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 biases, there are uh, uh, gray zones and, and whatsoever, but th there is the possibility that humankind uh, find the truth. Uh, I think that this was impossible, so to speak, to uh, uh, early modern uh, conception of truth because truth is God. So the only way to find the truth is going directly <laughs> to find God, period. Uh, and I think that, that this is necessary to, to, to differentiate uh, 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 our times, uh, uh, not only in terms of a broader audience, but also to us understand, to understand exactly what we are talking about when we are facing the system uh, uh, of uh, veracity, credulity, uh, falsehood that organized uh, uh, the idea of what is true or false, what is lie, what is truth, and, and, and things like that. Uh, and I think that the interesting thing with the analogy of, of our, with our times is that we are facing the erosion of this enlightened uh, Enlightenment-based idea of truth, uh, and this is interesting to not not interesting to live in this world, but uh, to <laughs> to see happening, and and it, it makes wonder uh, when we uh, 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 look into other uh, spaces and times uh, uh, to think about okay, what were, what were their uh, uh, their uh, uh, system of uh, uh, knowing that one thing is true or not, whether one thing is true or not, whether one thing is false or not. But this is the, 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 the first thing. And I, and, and I agree with you that the idea of expertise and authority uh, 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 are completely different. And, and, and I, the system of experts, in this sense, uh, uh, it's not a good expression for thinking uh, uh, this, the, the way uh, they verify that something is, is true or false uh, in early modern times. I, I think that authority is the key concept for this. So, uh, uh, and again, so uh, 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 I, I, I like an expression that uh, what define authorship, this is, this is a, 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 a literary uh, uh, scholar that said, what defines uh, authorship in early modern times is the concept of auctoritas, and auctoritas could be translated as authors that emulate authors, authors that copy it, other authors. So uh, there is no space for originality, for uh, uh, creativity in, uh, in romantic terms only for emulating what was already uh, uh, written, painted, sculpted, whatever, uh, said. So the authority is a, 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 a retroactive uh, 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 and, 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 and self-sustained uh, 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 way of authorizing things. But the problem is that this also has modulations. And for instance, uh, uh, at the same time, you can uh, find in Erasmus uh, letters 
uh, uh, things like uh, not the praise of, of uh, uh, the praise of some kind of authority, you have also Erasmus saying that uh, one should not uh, uh, follow uh, uh, blindly Aristotle or whatsoever. So it's it's kind of there. There is a kind of tension between this idea of authority, depending on uh, or depending uh, where or who uh, is is writing and to whom you are talking. So. And in this way, and in this uh, uh, sense, I, I agree with you that the rhetorical devices are completely central. Identify the rhetorical devices are, com uh, are something completely uh, uh, necessary to understand this uh, authoritative process of giving authority. And 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 this is something I I I, I haven't think about it uh, in the way you put it, and I think that this is it, this is, may be very interesting to compare, uh, not not compare in the short time, so 1601, 02, and then 1630, but to compare uh, 1588, 1599 with 1640s, 50s, and then 1660s. 70s uh, and, and see uh, if the rhetorical devices uh, change it, if there is, there was a clear shift of strategies. And I think that you, you are completely right when you see the Royal Society is a, a, a huge uh, 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 element of change. Uh, but I, I, it, it will be interesting it, to see, for, for instance, to compare Dryden's play about Sebastian of Venice. Uh, it's from 1672, I guess, with Monday, uh, with uh, Messenger's play of 1630s and uh, the Stuckley plays and the uh, Adventures pamphlets from late 16th, uh, 16th century and early 17th century and see if uh, um, this is something that I, I, can, I can do with some control uh, and, and, and it's, it's, it's feasible to do uh, and see if the vocabulary, if the uh, uh, terminology uh, 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 shifted or changed it. Uh, there is several, uh, there, there are just one thing that, that I, I'm really interested in, in, in doing that some uh, plays from the Renaissance period uh, with uh, Iberian uh, or African uh, 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 themes uh, with battles against the Moor, Spanish and whatsoever uh, that are partially related with the, the, the Sebastianist or the Sebastian or Alcazar plays, where uh, 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 reenacted and rewritten in the 1670s and 1680s, and some of them uh, uh, were also adapted to kind of opera by Purcell, for, for example. And it would be interesting to see the changes. Uh, some people already did that, and so I, I didn't have to, uh, I don't have to do from the scratch, uh, I have to re uh, read what uh, uh, other uh, uh, authors did, already did, uh, have done. So uh, uh, in this sense, it's, it's possible to compare and see, for instance, the idea of Iberian relations, the idea of uh, uh, what is true and what wasn't, what, the idea of being an imposter or a pretender uh, to be false, because usually the more uh, uh, the more or, or or the Spaniard is usually uh, uh, depicted as false person, uh, 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 imposter, and things like that. So see if these things uh, change and how the vocabulary, uh, if the vocabulary actually uh, changed. So and about censorship, I, I, I really I really uh, love to think about censorship in in less uh, 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 
Foucaultianian, Foucaultianian terms. So uh, 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 I think that the censorship, uh, it's not only about control in terms of uh, uh, suppression, uh, but we can think about censorship, especially in early modern times, in early modern societies, in more, uh, 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 in richer ways. Uh, 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 and also because they are more flexible, uh, uh, but also because they usually were seeking for things that we, we never ever think that a censor or a censorship, censorship system would be interested about. So this is, this is something that I think that is interested to, to see. So uh, I guess that, that's, that's all that I, I can <laughs> answer. <laughs> uh, that's, that's fantastic, thank you. Well, so I'm afraid I will have to um, end our session today, but it was really interesting, especially the debate. So I would like to thank everyone and especially Luis Felipe for this really in intriguing talk. And also to thank you um, one more time for participating during this entire uh, year of discussion. We are going to come back next year. So please, keep tuned to our social media and blog or mailing list, and we will post our program as soon as possible. Thank you and see you next year. <laughs>